Aloha and welcome to Hawaii's Volunteer Champion here on thinktechhawaii.com, a program where we talk to people who work for nothing. Uh, what's with that? People who give up their most valuable resources, their time and their effort uh, for some cause or other. Why do they do it? And what do they do? So we're going to talk to some people from the Hawaii Humane Society today. But before I start that, uh, this is the first program we've recorded uh, since the incredible tragedy on Maui, the, or the death of Lahaina, really, and of, of well over 100 people now have been identified clearly. There's still some thousand plus who are uh, missing, not accounted for. So uh, it's an incredible tragedy. We're going to see worse. Uh, and when we talk about volunteers, there are hundreds of people volunteering to help with these. Uh, with this tragedy and uh, donating money, which is very valuable, but also putting in time and energy. So our hearts, we're heart stricken and our hearts and thoughts go out to the people of Maui. So with that, let me introduce Lindsay Kipnes, who is a uh, volunteer with the uh, Hawaiian Humane Society. Hi, Lindsay. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And we also have uh, Brandy Shima Bukuro, who is the communication manager or the manager of communications, whichever you like. Uh, and uh, she's with us from the Humane Society as well. Aloha. Aloha, Peter. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. And full disclosure, I am a volunteer at the Humane Society as well. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's jump right in here with you and to tell me, uh, what do you do for the Humane Society? Yeah, so I've had several roles um, since I started volunteering about a year and a half ago, but um, currently I am first and foremost a foster parent. Um, I typically take on young kittens, um, which is especially important during kitten season. Um, so anywhere I specialize in kittens, uh, usually about eight weeks and under. Um, they need to be in homes um, because they are the most susceptible to being sick. They usually come to us with a lot of diseases, medical issues, um, and we kind of take care of them to get them healthy, to get them um, up to the right weight so that they can then get spayed or neutered and then go up for adoption. Um, so they're really our most, uh, you know, our our most needed um, foster parents are for like these really little ones that need to get out of the shelter. All right. And then in addition to that, I also volunteer on campus at Hawaiian Senior Society, currently with the foster team. Um, I go in at least once a week for a shift and I help them with whatever is needed from bagging up new food and litter for foster parents to pick up to doing um, discharges of foster animals, really whatever is needed um, to support the very small team that's there. Um, and in the past, I have also volunteered directly with the adoptions department as well as a, a dog walker on campus. I just started with the adoptions department and I used to be a dog walker until then I found that the dogs were walking me instead of me yeah. walking the dogs. So uh, I, I moved on to a uh, little more indoor work. Uh, so why did you change from one to the other? Why, what, what led you to go from, uh, I assume, walking or, or adoption department into fostering? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, I started, my first thing that I started as was a foster parent at home, um, and I've been fostering kittens the entire time. Um, but I started on campus as a dog walker because I missed having dogs in my life. I've previously uh, volunteered with dog rescues, and I wanted a way to get some exercise as well as be with the dogs, um, but also wanted to use volunteering as a way to like socialize and meet people that were like-minded. Um, and dog walking was a great way to do that. Um, but uh, because of some of the time constraints around it, um, it really just didn't fit into my schedule as well. Um, and I moved over into the adoptions department, which is um, a department that I have volunteered at and other rescues um, as well. I find that working in adoption is really rewarding. You get to talk to the people a little bit more and you get to help help the people find their animals. Um, and it's, you know, it's like the happier side of working um, for a shelter or rescue, as I'm sure you've seen, starting to volunteer there. Yeah. Uh, and then a couple months ago, I actually started um, volunteering twice a week. I had some extra time on my schedule, and the volunteer coordinator had specifically asked if I was interested in working with the foster department. 
Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go twice a week. Like, let's try out something new. Um, and really also to understand what the back of the house at um, Hawaiian Jimmy looks like. You know, I mostly just worked front of house and seeing how um, how the available dogs are doing, how the adoptions work. And so it's been a really eye-opening experience to understand like the behind the scenes workings of the shelter, um, being in and around all the butt stuff, um, seeing how the foster program really works, not just from accepting the animals, but figuring out how they're processed and how people are paired up with animals um, and all of that. So it's been a really good way to just get to know the whole organization. And uh, recently I had to go back down to only volunteering once a week, but um, hopefully I'll be able to, to volunteer in both adoptions and um, and foster coming up. So you talked about time commitments, but isn't fostering kind of like 24 uh, seven? You know, we've got a picture, I think we can show uh, of having, of hand feeding these little, little bitty uh, animals. Uh, I mean, isn't that a big time commitment? It is, yes. Uh, fostering is a very big time commitment depending on the animal that you take. So if you're bottle feeding, the really little neonates, um, that is around the clock. I have only bottle fed uh, weaned kittens, so that was feeding every four hours, but they were able to go overnight without a feeding, so that was great. Um, but for me, it's not much added. It's like, you know, maybe I spend 30 minutes total cleaning um, throughout the day, depending on how messy they are. But otherwise, the kittens are really just like a fixture in my life, like a normal animal would be. I don't have any of my own pets, so we're able to really focus on our, our foster animals. Um, and so I don't, I don't feel like I'm actually spending, you know, 24 seven with them. Um, and I love it. So I work from home, I work remotely and, um, it's really what like forces me to step away from the computer and take, you know, those mental health breaks and, and remind myself that like, you know, what are we doing this for? And, um, it just brings me and my partner so much joy to have little kittens running around our home and to have something to pour our energy to, um, and to be able to see like how much good we're able to do for them and the community. That's terrific. Brandy, uh, let's bring you in here. And uh, I imagine among the many different kinds of, of uh, uh, volunteers the Humane Society needs, uh, fostering is one of the harder ones to get people to do. Is that correct? You know, it, it, you'd be surprised. There are a lot of people who want to provide the gift of their time, right? And as Lindsay has mentioned, and as I've learned now as, as also being a neonate foster on, on the side, on top of my day-to-day -day job, um, it is a significant time commitment, but it is extremely rewarding and extremely fulfilling. And there are people who absolutely answer the call for that, which isn't to say that we don't have a need, right? Um, when it comes to kitten season and, and cats are warm weather breeders here in Hawaii, obviously that's year round. Um, so we are, uh, we do have an influx of cats and, and neonate kittens, as Lindsay has mentioned, almost a year round. Um, so there's always a need for more. Um, and it provides and it leaves um, some space within our officer volunteer network to have a little bit of a breather so it doesn't feel like a torrential tide of, of a constant barrage of kittens that you have to take care of, right? Um, the many hands, uh, you know, help to ease that burden. But um, as you've heard, and obviously as you've seen too, as a dog walker and an adoptions volunteer, we have so many diverse roles within this organization. And Hawaiian Humane Society at its heart is the volunteer organization. We have uh, nearly a thousand active volunteers who are supporting the day-to-day -day operations um, of our Mo'ili'ili campus. And we will be actually bringing online more volunteer roles to support our new Crisalza family campus at Ho'opili and Eva Beach. Um, but and it, it, it ranges, right? It's not always front facing for those who would prefer to be behind the scenes. We are always looking for laundry volunteers, for facility support volunteers, um, you know, admission support, uh, even administrative support and on our development team. Uh, we're going to be bringing online for it in the next couple of months for those who are extremely gifted on the photography side. We are always looking for photography volunteers and we're going to be bringing that role online soon. Um, because the way that our animals are, are presented on our website is often the first peek at, at a potential adopter, right? Uh, that helps to get them that much clo closer to finding their loving home. Um, so finding people who want to come out and take some fantastic headshots of our wonderful adoptable pets is, is really important. And that's really key, right? Every volunteer role is important. 
last fiscal year, we had oh, close to 100,000 volunteer hours total that supported the operations of the animals in need here on Oahu. And we could not function without that community support from our volunteer Ohana. And people like you and, and Lindsay are just giving the gift of your time. And it's so meaningful. I hope that you find it as fulfilling for you as it is for me as a volunteer on the side, just for animal welfare, right? I, I will tell you, uh, as I, first of all, when I tried dog walking, I got, I got walked by the dog and my first day as a, uh, an adoption volunteer, and I'll be very frank, it was harder than I expected to walking around Moiliili uh, campuses. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a rabbit warren over there. And uh, it, I enjoyed it. I loved it. But uh, I found it, uh, I got home and I was, I was pooped. But uh, so I'll be in better shape for next time. But uh, we have some photos. I think we could show some of those now. Uh, dog walking is big. How many, do you have a rough idea how many dog walkers uh, you need in a, in a day, in a week, in a month? You know, our, it, that ultimately, the need, the need ultimately depends on the number of animals in our care, right? And uh, the sad reality with Hawaiian Humane and shelters across the nation are that we've been over capacity for dogs. Um, it, because people are being forced to have to make really difficult decisions at the cost of living and, you know, the lack of affordable pet friendly housing are just so prevalent here. Um, so, but I think what I really want to instill here is that dog walking is a critical function of enrichment and exercise for the dogs in our care. The reality is, is that a home environment is the best place for any animal to be. Um, so the shorter amount of time they're here in the shelter is better for them from a physical and mental well-being state of mind. But while they're with us, our dog walker volunteers, they, they fill a critical role because they're providing that enrichment, that break from a kennel, um, that little bit of exercise and, and mental uh, stimulation that helps to make it a less, uh, you know, stressful environment and less anxiety induce, inducing, right? Um, so it's a really, really important role for the health of our animals here. Obviously, we have dedicated animal care specialists who are also filling that role, but having that extra level of support is just really important for animals in need. Um, and as you've demonstrated, there's, because there's so many diverse roles, finding the right fit is uh, for what your skill set is, and honestly, what your time uh, commitment is as well, is uh, something that we're happy to accommodate. Lindsay, you, you've done three different roles there, and I take it uh, you're happy, you're pretty happy with uh, the fostering, but uh, would you recommend the other, the other kind of jobs? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. I, you know, I kind of had the same, uh, reaction with you with dog walking. It was very strenuous. Um, and I am quite petite and sometimes I just having not had a ton of experience walking larger dogs who just don't have the training of how to walk on leash. Sometimes they were walking me. Um, and so I think it's definitely a great way to like get in your puppy fix if you want to walk dogs, but it is a lot of work. Um, but I would definitely still recommend it. I love working in adoptions. That to me was, you know, a lot more if you want to be people to people, which I love to do as well. Um, and one of the other reasons why I really enjoy adoptions is getting to work with the staff. And um, that's one of the things that draws me back every week to Hawaiian Humane is that the staff is just so incredibly friendly and fun to work with. Um, and, and, you know, fostering as well um, is kind of the same thing. I, I just, I like to have the variety in it. Um, I do, I am very actually personally even interested in seeing what some of the other like admissions volunteering sounds really interesting. Um, sometimes they take volunteers with the vet staff as well um, to learn that side. So I think it's just a great way to, you know, you, you can test it out, do a couple, like three to six months in, in a bunch of different categories and see, you know, what works with your schedule and your skill set and who you really connect with and, and feel like you're doing the most good. So for me right now, that's working in foster, but, um, you know, I'm hoping come as kitten season slows down, maybe I'll be able to go back to adoptions a little bit and get to be with those people and those animals again. Do the puppies get fostered too, or is it just kittens? Yes, it's puppies as well. Um, it's any animal that's going to be not available to go out for adoptions yet. They're typically looking for foster. So puppies under eight weeks um, or like dogs that have any um, physical ailments for any reasons, like they've, they've got some medical reasons why they need to be on hold for a while. Um, we have some amazing puppy fosters who take on full litters and sometimes bottle feed and 
you know, I think kittens sometimes is a lot when you've got three of them running around, destroying your bathroom, pooping everywhere. But puppies are just so much work. Um, so they definitely are always, they, they, I think they get less of them in. Uh, but if you're looking for puppies, they definitely do have that and need people on call for puppies as well. And I would make point, Pierre, because um, the, you know, Hawaiian Humane is the only open admissions shelter here on Oahu. And what that ultimately means is, is that if somebody is just not able to provide for care for their pet anymore, they come and, and bring them to us uh, and we take them in. And they, these animals might, they're coming from very diverse backgrounds. We're relying on the finder or their owner to tell us what information we have, we can, so we can, you know, find the best match for them, whether it's medical care, foster, or if they're available for adoption. Um, there's a lot that goes into um, the animals that are brought to us before they're even made available for adoption. We vaccinate every single animal that comes to us uh, for whatever species that's specific to them. Um, but what's really key here is that there are animals that are coming to us who need a significant amount of time to recuperate from surgery, right? Um, well, Hawaiian Humane does not euthanize, euthanize for space or time. And so that's why the foster network is so critical because we don't, we obviously have a finite amount of space even across two campuses now. Um, so, and again, like I mentioned earlier, the best place for them to thrive is to be in a home environment. And that where even a temporary foster home is ideal. So we'll have neonate puppies or kittens. We'll have full grown dogs or cats or rabbits or, or guinea pigs who are recovering from surgery. Um, and we actually have our foster care team has an incredible resource. It's an internal, uh, what we call a Trello board. It's like a bulletin board that's updated in real time where the needs are for any specific foster animal are posted. And it'll tell you what the, if they need, uh, you know, a certain type of lifestyle or home to thrive in, um, if they need a specific time commitment. Um, so you can foster basically what you're able and what you have the bandwidth and resources to provide. Let, let's spell out something you said and then elaborate on a little bit because I think people want to know. You said no animal is euthanized for space or time. Uh, tell, that, uh, tell us what that means exactly. You know, there's a perception of, uh, you know, with animal shelters that will have a certain time limit, right? If an animal gets surrendered to us or if they're brought to us as stray, um, that, you know, they only have a certain amount of time with us before, you know, we have to free up kennel space. Um, and so they're automatically euthanized, even though they're an adoptable, healthy animal. Hawaiian Humane does not do that. Um, we don't do it for space limitations. We don't do it for time limitations. There are really only specific reasons why we would, and it's almost, it's always for the quality of life of the animal, right? So if they have a, an untreatable medical condition, um, if there are issues with capacity for care, or if it's a severe behavioral issue that cannot be modified or corrected, um, and that would basically create a public safety risk. Um, but those decisions are always difficult to make. There are multiple different operational teams that are weighing in on those decisions. Um, and it's always for the benefit of the animal and the quality of life that they would have later down the line that's taken into consideration. Thank you. That's good to know. I think uh, that gives people uh, an assurance about surrendering their pets or bringing a, an animal, a, a feral animal uh, in and, and uh, uh, knowing that the, 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 they're, they're not going to be gone for any of those reasons you mentioned, only for Absolutely. behavior or, or, or for illness. Uh, that can't be solved. So, Lindsay, going back to you for a moment, I would think, I've never fostered, uh, but I would think after however many weeks of fostering a kitten or a puppy, giving up that animal must be a wrenching decision. What What's it like? It is so hard. We're actually giving up our, our foster currently um, tomorrow, so I'm about to hit that you know, you fall in love with all of them in different ways and you learn different things from every animal that you take into your care. Um, but for me, like the goal is always goodbye because if I can pass on my foster, my current foster, then my home is available to take in new ones. And it's become even more clear to me that this is important in volunteering with the foster department because I can now see how many animals are in the shelter waiting for foster homes. And so it makes it that much easier knowing that like, okay, well, you know, there's 50 cats currently waiting at, a, uh, you know, for example, there's like 50 cats waiting 
to be coming out for foster. Um, so by being willing to give my two kittens back, I'm able to then take the ones that need it. Um, now, you know, you can always adopt. Um, I am currently in a position like where my apartment is a little bit hard to separate the space um, to be able to have a resident animal as well as take on um, the litters of kittens that I do. Um, and so it's important to me that we continue to adopt, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get any easier, but it's always worth it in the end. And the best way to fill that little kitten shaped hole in your heart is to take a new one. And the foster team is always obliging. So as long as you clean your space really thoroughly with the right materials, uh, they they will like literally when you hand your kitten in and they clear their vet check, they're like, okay, would you like to take some more home today? Um, so they're willing to really push it on you there if you're willing to take them. And usually I take a couple days in between, um, to, you know, clean everything and get my heart back in the right place. Um, but there's always someone else in need. And, um, and so it makes it just that much easier and it's uh, great. I love was it. There, yeah. Was there ever a kitten that you were glad to give back that it was such a little <laughs> nuisance, such a little kisser, uh, scratcher, uh, claw, or, you know, was there ever one that you said, I'm glad this one's give, going back, I'm going to get another one? I will, yes, we've had a couple of those. Um, usually it's just because, um, you know, they start to escape the playpens that we t tend to keep them in and are running around the house. We did have one kitten that had a couple of behavioral issues um, that we were struggling to deal with. He was just really stressed out. Um, and I don't think that we were the right home for him anymore. He needed to be with another cat in a different environment. Um, and so when we were able to give him back and he actually got adopted within like a week. Um, so, you know, it's it's always a happy ending there. And it, I would still felt like I learned a lot. He had a medical condition and that we actually had him for quite a while because um, he had to have two different surgeries. And so it was. Um, it was really cool to like learn to foster that, but I was also very happy to let him move on to the next cycle of his life um, and the next stage and let him find his forever home. And just to be clear, if you're fostering, uh, you have certain supplies that are needed. Are, are those your financial responsibility? Does the, does the Humane Society pay for the food and the whatever the things that are needed? Yeah, so Hawaiian Humane will provide you with as much as they can. Um, typically, it's going to be like all of the basics. So food for kittens, it's food, litter, um, litter boxes and scoops. And then um, play pens, if you have really little ones, toys, they'll provide all of that. Um, I have personally like expanded what I wanted for them. And I've had people, you know, give them to me as gifts, some other stuff. But the the more important um supply that they do provide and for me also the most important thing is all the medical care is fully provided by hawaiian humane um especially because that is what is ultimately i think the most expensive um and the most stressful part is being able to get to the vet on time when you need it and um providing the medicine that is needed to help these cats get to a point where they can then be adopted into their home and let me ask you a tough question. If there is anything you would change about the volunteer program, I'm not asking for you to diss anybody or anything, but if you could change anything, uh, Brandy's here listening, taking notes. Uh, what is there anything you would change? Is there something uh, you would wish were done differently? Oh, I don't know. Um, no, you know, I, I really love it. Um, I, I see there's reasons why they have certain structures the way they do for consistency. Like it is a three month minimum when you start, but once you become a really consistent volunteer, um, they are able to be a little bit more flexible if you're going on vacation, if you're willing to make up shifts, uh, with my time constraints, like I'm able to kind of shift certain shifts, um, as needed, maybe some different shirts. Um, I'm wearing my volunteer teaching right now. It's a little bit thick for the Hawaiian heat. Um, right. But I will say I did realize that, um, you know, I, I think one of the reasons they do it is everyone's in a green shirt and the dogs recognize that people in green shirts are good and will walk them and have treats. And so dogs that you've never met before will come up to you because they like, they see the colors and they know like, oh, this is someone that is going to be helping me. Um, but yeah, you know, I... It, 
I love all the volunteer staff and I think they're really great and how the program is run. I'll tell you that I agree with you about the t-shirts being thick. And I assume that it was because they're going to be washed to, to death. But uh, anyway, that's that's terrific. Brandy, let me, uh, we've only got a few more minutes. Uh, we do have a couple of pictures more to show. And, and uh, one of the things to say, to note is it's not all, quote, glamorous. Uh, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. We have a, one of the pictures from the laundry. You guys go through towels and quilts and whatever, you know, like a hotel. Because you are a hotel, after all, in a certain mm -hmm. kind of way. Uh, what are some of the other behind the scenes roles that people uh, can play? You know, laundry is incredible. And it's we have some really unsung heroes there because, like you mentioned, it's not it may not be glamorous, but it's really critical because sterilization and cleanliness is really important for the health of our animals and to mitigate disease risk and spread. Right. Um, so there's that. We also are always looking for facility support. Um, so if you are a handy person and want to dedicate your time to beautification, whether it's landscaping, general, uh, you know, facilities, upkeep, that sort of thing, we have facility staff. Uh, who is a small but mighty team and are always looking for support. Um, anything in the administrative side. So if you uh, would love to help out our development team on fundraising, if you would like to dedicate your time for administrative support, um, Dispatch is um, also has volunteers that work 24-7, uh, um, as well as our paid staff. Um, so it's really just that extra uplift to support the staff that are here. Um, and do some other little tasks that are that help to really make this organization really run. All right, that's great. Uh, if somebody wants to volunteer, maybe we can show a picture of the happy group of volunteers uh, that we have. If somebody wants to join this happy group, I didn't realize that you had a thousand and a hundred thousand hours. How does somebody go about joining up? Uh, they can sign up at hawaiianhumane.org. We actually have different roles and different places that you can sign up there. We also have an interest sheet for those who are interested in volunteering at our new Crisalda family campus uh, in Eva Beach. Um, but all of that information is there and they will get trained. Um, we have a pretty significant training protocol, as I, I think you are both aware of, mm -hmm. both, uh, uh, you know, hands-on and uh, virtual training. We want to make sure we're providing the best tools for everybody to succeed here. Terrific. Thank you. HawaiianHumane.org. Uh, just see, and you can also find all the animals that are available uh, today there. So uh, I recommend you going there. Lindsay, thank you. Uh, any last words of advice for people who want to, uh, are thinking about doing this? Just jump in and get involved and you definitely won't regret it. Um, with the animals and the people, any position that you can volunteer at, like will definitely be valued. And I, you know, I think that we gain out of it just as much as they do. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Lindsay, thank you for what you do. And uh, thank you for uh, spending this half hour with us. Brandy, St. Denis, I know you're getting the big bucks for being here. Uh, but uh, thank you very, very much uh, for doing that. Uh, and uh, I will see you around the campus because I'll be back there. Uh, we always end uh, uh, the program with a, a, a quote or a, a thought about uh, what it means to volunteer, to give back, what generosity means. Uh, here's here's the quote for, for this week from Muhammad Ali, uh, and he basically talks about giving back as the rent we pay for living on this planet, which I think is a you know profound and beautiful. Uh, thought and the world wouldn't operate without volunteers. So we're very grateful to all of you. I know, I know. Kidding aside, you go above and beyond. I saw that little creature. I think that you uh, are have taken home Brandy, and and uh, uh, if that's not a full time job, I don't know what is. So thank you both very much. It's really been a pleasure. Uh, thank thank you to my two dedicated listeners. Maybe there are a few more uh, as we keep moving forward, but. Um, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks and talking about why people volunteer and what they do and what the possibilities are and how important it is. So thank you both again very much. Uh, and um, see you around the Moilili campus. Aloha. Thank you, Peter.